Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here to welcome you to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Broadcast. Uh, we are super excited and extremely happy to welcome Dr. Sarah Vincent today to speak about a very timely topic, which is cultural considerations in diagnosing and treating ADHD in African-American children. Um, before we get started, just let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you who are watching the live webinar may download the slides right now by clicking on the event resources section of the webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate attendance option, you'll get an email directly after the broadcast ends with instructions. Um, for those of you who may be listening to this in replay or in podcast mode, please visit the webinar replay page on the Attitude website. That's attitudemag.com slash webinar slash ADA. ADHD hyphen and hyphen culture, ADHD and culture, for access to both the slides and the certificate of attendance option. So with that, let me introduce Sarah Vincent, Dr. Sarah Vincent today. Um, she is a physician. She specializes in child and adolescent, uh, adult, child and adolescent, and forensic psychiatry. She's Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at Morehouse School of Medicine, where she's the creator and rotation director of the psychiatry mini rotation for intern, pediatric interns, and also the co-editor of the Pediatric Mental Health for Primary Care Providers, a Clinician's Guide. She's the founder of the Lorio Psych Group, an Atlanta, Georgia-based mental health practice that provides expert care and consultation. She has an impressive background. She graduated summa cum laude from Florida A&M University with honors from University of Florida Medical School and completed her psychiatric training at Cambridge Health Alliance Harvard Medical School. While there, she also received specialized training in trauma and then returned to the South to complete fellowships in both child and adolescent and forensic psychiatry at the Emory University School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Vincent has received numerous award, awards in recognition of her service and leadership. I will not read them. Her credentials um, are on, on your screen, but she is... Um, a star in her field and has been elected and appointed to national and statewide offices by her professional peers, the immediate past president of the Georgia Council on Child and Lesson Psychiatry and currently the secretary of the Georgia Psychiatric Physician Association Board, speaker at national conferences. So again, we're very honored to have her today. Um, Dr. Vincent will talk, present her slides and give an overview of her topic for somewhere in the 30 to 40 um, a minute range, and I invite you to post your questions as they occur to you. She will take questions at the end of this of her talk, and um, we'll do as many as we have time for. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Vincent again with our thanks for being here today. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really excited about this conversation today. As a child psychiatrist, the chief complaint of ADHD or question of ADHD is really sort of a bread and butter topic for me and something I talk to families about all the time. Um, and I treat patients um, in two very different settings. One is a private practice um, in a very affluent community in Atlanta, and one is a public health clinic in a community that has a lot of psychosocial uh, stressors and that has a lot of um, experiences with poverty and things like that. And I see, you know, Black kids in both of these settings, and certainly uh, that informs my work as, as well as my formal training. And so in terms of what's ahead and thinking about ADHD um, and African-American children, uh, one of the first things I wanted to start with was curbing cultural competency. And so I know the title is Cultural Considerations, but I really want to sort of push back a little bit around that. Um, and hopefully that will make sense as the presentation goes on. Uh, thinking about racism, ubiquity, and role uh, when it comes to any mental health issue, but certainly when it comes to how children are looked upon and how their behavior is characterized or categorized, uh, diagnoses in context, um, interventions and collaboration, and then what do we think about uh, how we approach these things moving forward based on what we've discussed and shared today. So take, for instance, uh, that you have an eight-year-old African-American male that may give you an idea of sort of what this child may experience or what the family's like, uh, but that is only one small piece of that child's life experience or of what they may have been exposed to or of what their family uh, may be contending with. So if you have a young boy who's from Chicago's inner city, 
uh, who's been exposed to community violence or structural issues in that setting uh, versus someone who has grown up in an affluent suburb like Maryland's Prince George's County uh, versus someone who grew up in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, even though they're all eight-year-old Black boys, the other cultures that they've been exposed to, the other things that sort of shape their resources internally, the family's resources, um, how they may think about mental health engagement or treatment or what may have driven them into mental health engagement or treatment are all going to be really, really different. And so these are three uh, sort of dramatic examples, but I hope that you come back to this uh, because it's really important not to generalize um, one experience to all African-American children or families. Often what you see in sort of the more prominent portrayals is that first example of kids who grow up um, in sort of hyper-segregated inner city communities, uh, but that certainly isn't where all Black children live, and even Black children in those communities don't have universal experiences. And so when you think about culture, uh, the values that people have, the way that they operate in the world, the way that they make sense of uh, what's happening around them, what they take pride in, uh, their traditions, it's much more than race. Um, and part of why I start with that slide before uh, is to get you thinking about that. And so it's important to think about that and what that might mean, but also to understand it's part of the cultural picture. It does not entirely define the cultural picture. And it would be a mistake to think that because I know this child's race, I know a lot about their culture. The other thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, often in these discussions, uh, and it's well-intentioned, uh, there's this idea of cultural competency, that if I go to a webinar and I learn about uh, stigma in Black communities or Black communities being more religious, now I'm ready to go treat all the Black kids, or I'm able to um, have conversations with families about Black children and ADHD. And so with competency, there's this idea that you learn these sort of demographic things. Um, and because you've learned those things, you're now prepared uh, to do this work or to understand these issues. Um, and it implies that there's an endpoint. Um, and it's often focused on race. So even though it's cultural competency, a lot of times the sort of fallback or prominent aspect of that um, culture that they talk about is a racial one, right? But there is a culture of being in rural America that is different than being in urban America. And often those sorts of distinctions aren't part of that conversation. And so what I ask for you to strive for, um, if you're a clinician, and what I ask for you to uh, help your providers with, if you're a parent or if you're someone who is making use of mental health services, is to really think about humility. Um, and this is the idea that even though the quote unquote expert or the mental health professional may know a whole lot about ADHD, you're the expert on your child or on your family. Or if you're the provider, that patient, that mother, that caregiver is the expert on that child and on that family. And so you really want a dynamic that's more about humility, not assuming that the provider understands um, and that education being a two-way process of the professional educating about the disorder and the caregiver and the child educating about uh, that child and that family's realities, challenges, ideas about ADHD or mental health issues, um, and their ideas about treatment as well. Another question that I encourage you to ask is, is it cultural or is it structural? And the difference is structural is really focused on society's systems and how they operate. Uh, so for instance, one of the things that is often said in sort of these cultural competency webinars is that African-Americans have a cultural distrust of providers. Well, if we think about some of the things that African-Americans have gone through in the medical system and continue to experience in the medical system, it's not so much that there are people who aren't willing to trust, it's that these systems haven't shown themselves trustworthy. Um, and so rather than sort of placing the pathology in a group of people, uh, thinking about 
why there may be responses uh, given the realities of what they experience in a society. Um, the other thing I'll point out too is that sometimes there are things that have different implications for uh, Black families given the way that Black children are treated than they do in the larger society. And that could play into how mental health issues are perceived. So it really has less to do with um, a culture's unwillingness to deal with something and more to do with uh, what it means for that culture um, in the broader society. And then thinking about disparities versus inequities. So there's often, you know, talk of disparities that, you know, there's less access to care, they're less likely to get diagnoses or less likely to get treatment. Um, and disparity uh, just really captures that there's a difference, whereas an equity forces you to think about, is this something that we can trace to a cause? Is there something that's underlying that we can look at and understand? So when you talk about uh, Black children not engaging in therapy as often when they have mental health issues, it's not really a disparity, it's an inequity because uh, what we know is a driver of that is inadequate access to health care or not having adequate health care uh, coverage networks or those sorts of things. Uh, so really thinking about the societal um, pieces that are driving these things because that is going to be ultimately uh, part of the solution in areas where we may be able to intervene. And then the implications of trauma. Trauma is something that has the ability to manifest in a number of ways, some of which are contradictory um, and some that aren't always consistent. Uh, but when it comes to any mental health condition, the consideration of trauma is a critical one uh, because it really can look like depression, anxiety, ADHD. Um, and so thinking about trauma is important in all children, but when it comes to African-American children, it's takes on a higher uh, value. And the reason is uh, we know that Black children as a whole are more likely to be exposed to trauma than white children are. Um, and this can take the forms of interpersonal trauma. So things like abuse or uh, neglect but it can also uh, take on things that aren't as widely appreciated or talked about in some mental health settings. So racial trauma or structural trauma. Um, racial trauma, of course, would be things like seeing images of people who you relate to who are being harmed or killed on social media. It could also be experiences of racism in the school setting um, or in neighborhoods where children are living. And by structural trauma, uh, what I mean is when there are systems that are entrusted with children's lives uh, that have a big say in terms of what their day-to-day -day experiences are, that rather than working in a way that supports that child's healthy growth and development are actually harmful to them. So an example of this would be uh, when students notice the differential discipline that is given to white kids versus black kids. Um, and it's well documented uh, that misbehavior isn't really all that different from a rape standpoint when it comes to kids, but how that behavior is responded to is quite different. Um, and so when children are forced to go to a place where they're not treated fairly, uh, that is a form of trauma as well. And so in thinking about uh, this issue of racism, uh, one of the other things that it's important to point out um, is that there's a way that this can definitely get tied into school and to how they think about their future. Um, so buying into school, being motivated about school, doing your school work really relies on a belief that you're going to grow up one day and be an adult and that your choices are going to matter in terms of what that adulthood looks like. Uh, when you are aware that people who look like you may be harmed, um, not for necessarily doing anything bad, but for just being, um, or when you're in a neighborhood where you see constant community violence and where you see people that have been stuck in uh these cycles of not having what they need for generations, it can be really hard to see that future for yourself or to believe that you have a role in shaping it. 
And so part of where the desire to learn and the motivation to learn comes from is having a stake in that future. The other thing that's important to point out is that depending on the school setting, a school may end up being a place where rather than feeling encouraged, that child feels targeted and where they may in fact be uh, on the receiving end of being targeted. I mean, this goes for both black boys and uh, black girls. If you haven't seen or read the book, uh, Push Out, it's a really great uh, resource for sort of understanding this from a black girl uh, perspective. And so sometimes what looks like ADHD, you know, not completing assignments or being anxious or fidgety or things like that is really a result of being forced to be in an environment that you experience as not useful or relevant to you, uh, but also that may be experienced as, as hostile. Um, and so how a child sees themselves, how they see their future um, impacts their academic engagement and can look like uh, symptoms of ADHD. In thinking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and again, this isn't unique to Black children, um, but it's something that is really important is to think about it in context. And so there's a lot of overlap uh, between symptoms of ADHD and symptoms of other mental health conditions. And sometimes what can happen because people are more familiar with ADHD, they may have had family members or other students who have had good responses to ADHD medications. Uh, sometimes the default is to assume ADHD when there actually may be other things going on. And it's not that the other things can't be going on in conjunction with, uh, but sometimes what happens is it gets an ADHD label when really these other issues are the drivers for it. Um, and so it's a, di it's a diagnosis that is both overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed um, in the broader community, but something that's critical to understand um, in the Black community is that there is a, uh, there are some beliefs that it's overdiagnosed in Black children and that Black children are overmedicated. Uh, but what the data shows us is that uh, it's actually underdiagnosed compared to white children and that Black children diagnosed with ADHD are actually less likely uh, to get treatment. Uh, but I really hope that this slide sticks with you um, because there is a lot of comorbidity even when ADHD is the issue. And so just because ADHD is arrived at as a diagnosis doesn't mean that the humility and the search and understanding what's really going on with this child is over or that it's complete. And so just in thinking about some of the core symptoms of ADHD and this and or. So with inattention, uh, of course, it could be an exacerbation of ADHD symptoms. Um, and that could be the actual root of the inattention is that they have this diagnosis. Um, but it could also be that there's impairments in their concentration because of depression. So one of the core symptoms of depression um, is decreased concentration. Um, and we know that when it comes to trauma, which disproportionately impacts Black children, uh, that the most common mental health illness or the most common mental illness following trauma is depression. Um, another thing that may impair concentration is worried thoughts. So if you are preoccupied because you're worried about whether you're going to have dinner or you're worried about whether your mom's boyfriend is going to hit her again tonight, that's going to make it really hard to be attentive to what the teacher is saying. And so it's not so much that they um, have ADHD, but it's more so that they have this anxiety or this trauma that's impacting them. A more extreme version of that would be things like nightmares or flashbacks. So if they're having nightmares, they may not be getting adequate rest. And even as adults, we know that our attention and our concentration isn't as good the next day if we're not resting well, or if they're having flashbacks in class where they're not only, you know, having their mind wander, but it's actually taking them somewhere else. And then of course, learning disorders. Um, and this gets back to sort of one of those structural issues that often uh, 
all communities don't have the same access to things like psychoeducational testing or the timeliness of that testing is not what it should be. And so you may have undiagnosed, unaddressed learning issues that are contributing to what's happening. You know, if I put a calculus three uh, question on this slide and started walking you through it and telling you about it, you would probably zone out because it's not interesting and you may not know what I'm talking about. Um, and that's the experience of children who have learning issues that haven't been addressed. Um, the other issue that you may see is observer bias. Um, so problematic behaviors may get more attention in the children who teachers or school administrators already see as problematic. Um, and we know that this is something that impacts Black children and their experience in these settings. Um, and also the fact that our society has a hard time sort of acknowledging and dealing with Black pain. Um, so you may be saying, well, what does that have to do with ADHD? Well, when a Black child undergoes a traumatic event or is exposed to traumatic things or lives in a neighborhood where these things happen often, um, there can be a lack of appreciation or empathy for what that means for that child um, and how they may respond to uh, not feeling safe or feeling rejected or not feeling supported. Um, low salient. So this is the idea that if school's not relevant or if it doesn't have things that they relate to in it, it's going to be hard to stick with. Um, and then psychosocial stressors. So even if they don't have a diagnosable mental health condition, uh, just the fact that they're living in a crowded environment or that they're hungry or things like that are going to make it harder to be attentive in class. Hyperactivity. So this, of course, could be an exacerbation of ADHD and the actual root of hyperactivity. But you could also have things like agitated depression, restlessness from anxiety, or reactivity from trauma. Uh, the other thing that may happen is unrealistic developmental expectations. Um, and paradoxically, in some kids, poor sleep actually causes them to be more uh, hyperactive. And then impulsivity. Um, so again, these same issues in terms of trauma and these uh, other diagnoses uh, come into play. What you may also see sometimes is survival behaviors and recklessness. So if you live in a community where you need to react really quickly to protect yourself, uh, then that may be something that's reinforced. Um, and it can be hard to turn that off once you're in a school setting versus one that is not. Um, if it's a parent's first child, sometimes things like hyperactivity or impulsivity that are developmentally appropriate um, may not be understood in that context uh, because they're not accustomed to having a child of this age around. So that's another uh, thing to consider as well. So the treatment and informed consent uh, process. So given the structural and societal context of Black children and Black families, um, there is a certain increased risk of untreated illness because of the lower tolerance that society has for uh, perceived misbehaviors uh, by Black children. Um, there are multiple studies that show that in our society, Black children are thought of as older and, of less and as less innocent. So they're not given the same benefit of the doubt or understanding that white children are. We also know that behaviors by Black children are more likely to be criminalized. So substance use happens at really similar rates across races, but Black children are much more likely to have DJJ involvement or criminal justice um, involvement or juvenile justice involvement uh, because of their substance use. So it's not that they are using more, but they're more likely to get into legal trouble uh, because of it. And this has connections with ADHD uh, because of the impulsivity. And certainly if that impulsivity or hyperactivity or inattention leads to uh, suspensions and expulsions, more unsupervised time and that sort of thing. Um, educational failure may have more impact for life trajectories. Um, and so education does matter, um, but the reality is that 
white people without a high school diploma make more than black people who have a high school diploma. Uh, so it's not just a matter of, you know, what this means for them right now in a school, but in terms of like what the rest of their life is going to look like. Uh, the school to prison pipeline, we know disproportionately impacts uh, under-resourced schools um, and heavily policed communities as well are just places where those childhood things that may uh, be even more impulsive um, because of this diagnosis are more likely to result in legal problems. And so we as providers, uh, for those of you who are providers uh, who are listening, really have to make it a point to show ourselves trustworthy. Uh, sometimes in these talks, there's, again, this cultural mistrust term that's used. And what that does is say, you know, that's that problem that Black people have rather than us acknowledging the role that the system in which we work um, plays in it. And so having a collaborative approach is really key. Um, and then also always coming back to what is actually the best treatment plan? You know, sometimes our treatment plan is really based on, well, this is what the data says and this is what the evidence says and that sort of thing. Um, when often that data may not have a representative sample of Black children to begin with. Uh, but the reality is, even if it does, the best treatment plan for any child or any family is the plan that they are able and willing to follow. And the only way that you're going to know what plan they are able and willing to follow is to take the time to learn about how they're thinking about their symptoms, how they're thinking about medication um, and what that family has in terms of their internal resources, even the scheduling of things in order for them to be able to follow through on any treatment plan um, that is devised. When it comes to medication, it's really important for people to understand sort of what medications do and what they may not do. Um, and so psychoeducation and choice is key. Um, because of potential prior negative experiences with systems, there may be more reluctance to do medication um, or there may be more reluctance to do it early on in the process. And certainly, you know, for younger kids, that's not a first line recommendation. And so making sure to emphasize what medicine does and what it doesn't do and that the parent always has or the caregiver always has the choice. Because of that issue of substance use, being disproportionately criminalized in Black communities um, or in Black people, even if they don't live in Black communities, uh, addressing fears of addiction can sometimes be a, an important factor. So again, it's not going to necessarily be a fear of every parent, but if they tell you that they're really concerned about the idea of their child being on medicine, you want to know what their concern is. Um, and sometimes it may be that they're really worried about addiction, particularly given uh the warnings that are associated with the medication. And so addressing those fears, making sure that it's understood that if the medicine is used as it's written um, and it's swallowed like a pill the way that it's supposed to be, that it's not something that's going to actually give their child the sort of buzz or reinforcement uh, that would cause addiction, that it's when people take more than they're supposed to or they take it in a different way than they're supposed to that you can start to get that. Understanding that medication is part of a plan, uh, that it helps, uh, but there still need to be those other things put in place. So going back to that slide with all of those different uh, potential considerations with ADHD on it, that those other things have to be addressed as well. Um, often the school setting is a key place where that happens. So if you have a child who's had untreated ADHD for a semester and has really fallen behind, you know, starting medicine is not enough. They're going to need medicine and a tutor to help them get caught up. They may need medicine and an evaluation to make sure that there's not some other learning issue uh, that's contributing to what's happening. Uh, they may need medicine and psychotherapy to address their trauma um, that they've experienced that continues to affect their day-to-day -day life. Um, and so not stopping with the ADHD diagnosis and not stopping with ADHD medications, uh, but really trying to understand the bigger picture. <laughs> 
Um, dosing and formulation. So we do know uh, that Black children are more likely to be publicly insured. Um, and that means that there may be more limitations in terms of uh, formularies. And so just knowing what that means, um, Black children are also more likely to be in single parent households. Um, so things like dosing medication before mom goes to work or dosing medication at a school, provided that school has reliable uh, school nursing services available um, or things that you want to make sure that you walk through. And then also just inviting the conversation around what it means to them to be on medicine. Uh, so again, not in all situations, but it is something to be aware of um, is that there is something called double stigma. And this is when you are already part of a marginalized or other or other group, um, in this case, it would be being a Black person in a racist society, um, and that being compounded by having another mark against you. So we are getting better as a society, but mental illness still carries a certain stigma. And so having the burden of racism plus the stigma of a mental health issue can really be aversive uh, to some families. And sometimes the idea of taking medicine makes the diagnosis feel more real. So where do we go from here or what sort of implications does this have? So one of the things that, you know, I encourage you to do is self-study. So again, it's not with the idea that you're going to be competent and that you're going to know about what the life of every Black person you come across looks like. But there are things about experiences in local communities where you live or in this country that would help you be able to put things in context. Um, and so in learning about if you're a white person, white fragility and your defensiveness to the idea that you might be biased is going to be really important in terms of being able to address these issues. Uh, so self-study is a good uh, first step. Since children spend most of their waking hours in schools, having an idea of how local school districts run, what resources they have, what inequities there are in terms of things like access to school uh, counselors or to therapists on the school um, roster or to uh, delays in psychoeducational testing. It's going to be a big part of understanding what's going on, but should also inform sort of your treatment planning and your steps moving forward. And so having some basic knowledge about those schools is important. And at the end of the day, this all comes back to family support and health as your guiding principle. And so really understanding that any intervention that supports the primary caregiver, that supports the family unit, uh, that helps them be heard and that helps them understand what's happening um, is going to be really important. That it's not just about stimulant medications um, or things like that, uh, but that these broader issues always have to be considered uh, because they could be drivers of symptoms and they certainly have a significant amount of interaction with the amount of distress that the child and the family is experiencing and the degree of impairment that they are experiencing. And so when it comes to ADHD and African-American children, it really is a matter of looking at the broader society, understanding how that could impact what they think about mental health issues, um, and applying that in a humble way as you enter into a collaborative decision-making process to help that child be better positioned uh, to do their best at home, at school, um, and in places, and in all the places uh, where they live, work, and play. Thank you. That was really very provocative. There are a lot of questions. Um, I want to start by asking you, Dr. Vincent, if you would... Um, amplify I thought what I thought was a really interesting comment about ADHD being both overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed in, in African American children. Um, that makes sense to me, both both of those ideas. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that happens and, and maybe in those three different kinds of communities that you identified at the beginning, um, how it plays out. 
Yeah. And so the, the overdiagnosis aspect of it is that often, you know, the, for, the sort of first stop, if there's a mental health problem or an attention problem is to like default to thinking is ADHD. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the forms and questionnaires that we have teachers do, they don't help you differentiate like that they have these symptoms because of this diagnosis or the other one. And so it, it, I, I call it like the entryway diagnosis for kids or the gateway diagnosis. Like the, a, a lot of times they'll stop at ADHD on their way to whatever else it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the sort of overdiagnosis part. And, the, and, the, and a big part of that is that, you know, mood disorders, trauma isn't appropriately appreciated. And, and a piece of that is because in order for you to understand that the child is acting this way due to trauma or to depression, you have to actually talk to the child. And you have to understand something about their life and their experiences. And for a number of reasons, it may be hard to do that or it may be hard for that child to trust an adult when adults have been the ones who have harmed them. And so it's really easy to look at external behaviors. Um, It takes more effort and a better rapport to understand other things that could be driving them. Um, So that's the overdiagnosis part. On the Mm -hmm. underdiagnosis part, um, it's just, you know, the same things around access to care, um, that concern around double stigma um, can impose barriers to getting sort of evaluation and treatment for ADHD. But on a, on a population standpoint, you know, Black kids are not diagnosed more um, with ADHD than, than white kids are. Okay. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, um, One of the listeners uh, says that she's a bit concerned about the number of references to trauma. Um, While she knows this is definitely plays into it for many of our children, um, she's concerned that white educators listening in will assume that trauma is a factor for black children they serve. Her daughter attends an all-white school, and she fears that the assumption that black um, children are involved with any symptoms that, that, that it's been going to be assumed that there's family trauma and difficult living standards. Yeah. And so, you know, part of why I talked about different kinds of trauma is that it's not just family, right? It's the mm-hmm. trauma of living in a society that is racist. And, you know, what we see is that being middle class actually doesn't protect black kids from things like suicide, Um, And in some cases, it even goes up. And part of that is likely because of increased increased experiences with interpersonal trauma when you are like the only Black kid in environments. And so, yeah, certainly it's not that, you know, Black families are more likely to like abuse their children. It's the issue of what it means to be a marginalized othered group in a society um, both from the messages that you're receiving from the society about, you know, whether you are good or bad um, and things like that, um, but also like the trauma of seeing Black people harmed. Like, you would be hard pressed to think of a widely shared video of a white person being murdered. Right. If I asked you to do that for a Black person, you could number off a list. That has a different impact on Black people than it has on white people. That is traumatic. Um, And that has nothing to do with the household. That has to do with the society that children are forced to sort of grow up in and be in. Um, And so, yeah, don't, don't assume negative things about Black families, but do understand that we have a society that because of things like redlining, mass incarceration, you know, educational inequities, that um, there's a disproportionate burden of trauma. Um, But even if you're not in one of those neighborhoods where that burden is most pronounced, there are still these other things that can, can, uh, that Black children experience. Okay. And and, and I also want to make sure that it's understood that it, it's not as if it's an either or, right? It can still be a both and, and that shouldn't be a reason for you not to, not to do it. But if we, if we miss trauma in kids, period, but in Black kids, we are doing them a terrible disservice. Um, and so it's important that we don't shy away from that um, because without addressing those things, we know that this has negative implications for not only mental health, but physical health, and not only in their child life, but in their adult life as well. And the ACEs studies are great examples of that. 
Okay, great. Um, speaking of black parents, there are a number of black parents uh, listening in who were or talking about or asking questions related to the difficulty of advocating for their child at school. Their sense is that, you know, advocating for your child, standing up for your child at school often has a backlash, has a negative impact on their child at the end of the day. And they're wondering if you have any thoughts on the best way as a black parent to stand up for your child, to advocate for your child in a school situation. Yeah. Um, and that is something that I have observed and that I know is a very real concern and experience um, for some of the families that I work with. Um, so I just want to start off by acknowledging that. And again, that's another part of like the structural racism that Black families and kids are up against. Um, that one of the things that, you know, I encourage families that I work with to do is to introduce themselves at the beginning of the school year. So, that your first conversation with the, you know, school counselor or the vice principal or whoever it is, is not in a emotionally charged uh, place where there's already sort of a negative valence to it, um, but that there's some sort of pre-existing communication around, you know, my child has this diagnosis or I want to make sure that you know who I am and that you know how to contact me and um, and things like that. Because like any other sort of relationship or dynamic, it's always better if you sort of have some, some positive interactions in the bank before you have ones that are more difficult or more challenging. Um, another thing I would say is, yes, sometimes there is backlash around advocating, but uh, the protections that you may be able to achieve for your child if they have an IEP in place um, are really important and they're worth sort of making that effort to get those things done. And there are certain organizations um, like Parent to Parent um, or maybe even your local NAMI chapter, depending on the makeup of your local chapter, that may have other parents who've also experienced this or even parent peers in some states um, are part of like the mental health workforce who could assist you um, with navigating this as well. So I would say look into those local supports because, you know, often they're going to have a better idea of how this like practically works than some of the, the mental health professionals are going to have. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes sense too. Um This is a teacher's question now. She says, what do you recommend we do to help our black students who tend to be labeled as behavior problems when actually they're the product of the double stigma and the special ed at the school just simply doesn't acknowledge that this exists? And so part of what really has to happen is a cultural change in schools. And of course, that requires buy-in from decision makers in those settings, Um, But if you're not in a position to sort of push for that change, you know, the thing about structural racism is that it permeates the entire system. So when something permeates the entire system, that means that everybody in that system at some point can be either part of perpetuating that or of trying to address it. So it could look like you taking some extra time with a child who you see is struggling um, and trying to understand sort of what's on their mind or what would be helpful for them. Um, Trying to think of if there's another student who might be a mentor um, for them uh, in this school setting. Uh, Thinking of ways that that child sort of supports or strengths can be shored up. So if this is a kid who really loves reading in class, that uh, you look for opportunities to let them to do that um, or to run errands for you, like just ways that um, they can practice and be acknowledged for uh, the strengths that they have, because often, and again, it's it's often well-intentioned, um, adults will focus on, you know, if a kid makes, you know, all A's and B's and a D in math, then we say, well, what's going on with math? We got to get you a math tutor. What's going on with that class, right? We focus on the deficit rather than the areas of strength. And so in a society where there's all this negative messaging and where um, we are primed to sort of associate Black with bad, um, being really intentional and on purpose sort of overcorrecting for those messages with um not not praise that's empty, but that it that it sort of acknowledges that child's um, strengths and for looking for ways to sort of shore up their supports. Okay. Um, 
there's some questions about uh, diagnosis specifically. Are there um, uh, this? Let me, this one person says I'm worried about the influence of teachers on the rating scales, especially for Black children. Um, Another one says, what are the most reliable assessment tools for minority children? So their concern here is that that the, the normed rating scales or the normal diagnosis system is not um, working well for African-American children, especially, you know, those who may also have trauma. Do you have any comments on how how to distinguish, tease apart um, the diagnosis, the differences and the issues in diagnosis for African-American children? Yeah, so the big thing with rating scales is to understand that they are not diagnostic. Um, and I'll say that again, because it's really important. And sometimes providers get this wrong. Rating scales are not diagnostic. All they tell you is that a child has this symptom. It does not tell you why. Mm. Um, and so you can look positive for ADHD based on a Vanderbilt or a Connors because you... Uh, smoked marijuana before you came to school. You can look positive because you have PTSD that's untreated and unaddressed. You can look positive because you didn't sleep the night before. So rating scale is only a documentation that these symptoms are present in the school setting. That is all it is. And so that has to be paired with a evaluation that looks for these other potential contributors, explanations, symptom drivers in the context of that family and of that environment, right? So, um, you know, I've had children who were 14 and diagnosed with ADHD after their mom went to prison and they went into defects and they went into juvie. Wow. Well, you know, they had a lot of reasons to have poor concentration given everything that was going on, but their Vanderbilt looked like they had ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if, if you take nothing else away from this, that rating scales are not diagnostic. All they are is an indicator that that child needs a comprehensive evaluation um, to, to see what's next. And if the evaluation or the evaluator that you, goes to, that you go to uh, claims to have evaluated in your child in 20 minutes, that's not an evaluation. Okay. Um, but you want to go somewhere um, where they really are um, understanding that scale. I have had families who I see in clinic who say, all they did was look at the scale and give me this prescription. Mm -hmm. That is not an evaluation. That is not acceptable. And you want to find somebody else to see your child if that was how it happened. That it sounds like the experience of many people who are yeah, adopt, who are diagnosed with ADHD. Um, do you have any specific comments on teasing apart from a practitioner perspective, trauma versus ADHD? And so... Sometimes it's hard. And, and like yeah. I said, sometimes they do run together. That said, um, you want to make sure that you're doing a thorough trauma screen and that you're also uh, paying attention to, again, those sort of um, structural issues, right? So I have a sense of different neighborhoods in Atlanta. And so if some, which is where I practice. And so if somebody tells me they live in this development, then I know to ask, you know, have you seen people harmed? Like, have you seen people uh, shot? Tell me what it's like there. Do you feel safe, right? Um, because there are ways that we often ask about trauma that focus on interpersonal trauma that don't ask about like neighborhood violence, community exposures, that sort of thing. And right. so, you know, the, the ACE questionnaire can be a good start, but it really leaves out um, some of these other issues like racial trauma and structural trauma, um, and there may be things that you sort of learn over time. So the very first visit, you know, that first hour, a family may have a hard time telling you about being in a home invasion and the mom's boyfriend getting shot. That might take a few months for mm -hmm. that to come out. Um, so understanding that part of it is about rapport building and about, you know, being interested, you know, something else to think about and ask about, um, and to, to make sure you're documenting are things like, you know, defects involvement um, or significant losses in the child's life because they may not 
always uh, conceptualize it as traumatic. It may just sort of be things that have happened to them in their life. But if the child's ever been removed from their primary caregiver, you want to know that and you want to know why. Um, and if there have been significant losses, whatever the reason for that loss was. And so a, a thorough trauma screen is really important. And then also looking for a temporal relationship. So uh, if the symptoms really started after a traumatic event, then that's going to make you more concerned about, you know, is this trauma versus ADHD? Right. Another thing to think about is, um, you know, when I'm talking to kids who say they have trouble paying attention in class, you know, my next question is, well, where does your mind go? Right. If it's trauma, it could be I'm worried about my dad in prison or it could be. I don't know how my mom is doing, or it could be, I think about what that man did to me. If it's ADHD, it could be the bird outside the window, <laughs> right? Yeah, so it could right. be anything um, that right. may or may not have this like loaded, you know, history behind it. It could just be any sort of distracting thing that's around them. And so right. really trying to get a sense of like, why is it that they're not attentive? Why is it that they can't concentrate? Um, and that a lot of times is going to be the thing that helps you tease it apart. And again, understanding that sometimes it's going to be a both and. Right. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's a listener here who's asking about the uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris's finding on the ADHD and ACEs study. Specifically, she's, she's wondering, you know, insurance won't cover trauma or poverty based behavior. So is there a concern about giving a child a label? Um, and how you know you just addressed some of how to one part of her question about teasing out the result difference between trauma and true ADHD, but any other thoughts on this issue of labeling and yeah, insurance so, coverage? Yeah, and so you know it's not as if they won't cover poverty, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, they won't cover poverty, but if a child has a constellation of symptoms that are causing distress or impairment, then it still may be a disorder. So uh, for instance, you know, as a practicing clinician, there may be some kids that I see who don't meet like all the criteria for PTSD per se, but they might meet it for trauma and stress-related disorder not otherwise specified. Got or it. they might okay. meet it for um, a depressive disorder, not otherwise specified, or they mm -hmm. might meet it for an anxiety disorder, not otherwise specified. So there are still ways that if it's to the point where it's distressing and impairing, there probably is something that will capture that. And right. it's really, really important to capture the trauma of kids because otherwise what happens is they get these treatments that never address the main driver of their problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as clinicians, we we can't single-handedly cure poverty, but if I think that that's a major part of their treatment plan of, of the problem, then part of my treatment plan is I'm talking to the social worker at the clinic and saying, what do we have in the food pantry, right? If I'm not addressing that that's part of the issue, then an opportunity for intervention can be missed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Then that, just some other questions that people ask about that very question as a practitioner, how do you address the underlying social issues? But yeah. Um, here's an interesting question. Can a, can a child with a history of trauma who meets criteria for both receive both diagnoses of ADHD and PTSD or yeah. does one exclude the other? Nope. One does not exclude the other and they absolutely can coexist. And, you know, ADHD has around a 70% heritability, right? So right. if you think about it from a, you know, sort of family resource standpoint, if you have a parent who has issues with executive planning, impulsivity, um, who had academic trouble that was never addressed or dealt with, um, then that has implications for like what they may be able to provide for their child. Mm -hmm. um, or how they may like parent their child. And so, you know, you, it's not as if again, like one happens without the other. And so the, it, there are definitely issues with our diagnostic, uh, system and structure, which is a whole other lecture. Um, but it, it doesn't, uh, say that if you diagnose one, you can't diagnose the other. Okay. And then to, speaking to the whole comorbidity issue, obviously, yeah. Um, here's someone who's a volunteer at a juvenile detention facility, and she sees um, over the years a number of children being labeled as conduct, having conduct disorder, and yet yet no one recognizing their ADHD symptoms that they also pre present with. What are ways to help 
children like this within and outside this kind of institution is her question. Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, and, you know, again, when we look at studies, when kids show up with the same symptoms, those same symptoms are more likely to be labeled as conduct disorder or ODD in Black kids. Right. Um, and so, you know, I formerly worked at a juvenile justice facility myself and definitely saw that um, things that were actually PTSD or ADHD or some combination that were just labeled as conduct disorder. Um, and so, you know, part of part of the conversation is helping um, parents and communities understand the purpose of all this, right? Like if, if, if the, if the perception is this is just about labeling my child, then that's not going to be well received. If the perception is this is part of a, part of the creation of a plan to help your child be as successful as your child can be, that's going to be looked upon, upon differently. Um, and so we have to sort of be willing to engage with people, even if they're skeptical about this idea of uh, mental health issues um, and help them understand sort of why treatment can be helpful um, and the ways that it can, um, you know, position your child to, to be at their best. Um, great. Here's a good the, one. Uh, and, oh, and, yeah. And one, Go sorry, one more thing to add on that is just, you know, sort of the bias of, of evaluators. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're in a position of authority or if you're an evalu any evaluator is in a position of authority because you're writing things that can have implications for a child for their life. So I just want to acknowledge that. But also if you're somebody who's in some sort of like, you know, administrative or supervisory or managerial role in a mental health clinic um, that really, you know, if your providers are disproportionately diagnosing Black boys with ODD and conduct disorder, that should be something you're talking to your providers about. That should be something you're providing supervision around. That should be something that you are counting and paying attention to in your system. Um, and so really, you know, on the front end of it, trying to make sure that your providers are adequately trained um, and supported in these issues that we've brought up today so that the sort of tip of the iceberg behavior isn't the only thing they're considering uh, when it comes to what they're writing about kids in their chart. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, positive behavior supports, PBS. I'm not familiar with that, but this is a person who asked whether you have experience with it. And she said that she's heard questions um, as to whether the, it, the PBS framework is insensitive to cultural and structural considerations related to race. Um, it is, do you have experience with PBS in education yeah. and what's your point of view on that? Yeah, so, um, and it was actually something that was adopted in a really widespread way in the juvenile justice facility where I worked. And, you know, I'll say when it comes to most interventions and even, you know, <laughs> the our diagnostic systems, they're not appropriately normed um, for all populations. Um, it, but even if that's the case, there are still elements of it that are useful and ways that we can you know, see if it's achieving the result that we want. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of sort of measuring, right? So if you start PBIS, do your referrals go down? Do your uh, academic achievement scores go up? Do your days in suspension go down? Um, because that is what tells you whether it's an effective intervention for the population that it's being employed in. And if you're not seeing the changes you want, then thinking about why you're not um, and what the changes may need to be for that population and for that school. Um, because it really is important to acknowledge that, you know, I talked about culture at the beginning and how race is a part of it. You know, schools have their own culture too. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain elementary schools in the same school district that operate very differently than other elementary schools. Um, and PBIS not working or working may be in some part a function of the school culture versus, you know, the, the child. Um, but that's why it's important that we recognize um, there's not a one size fits all approach to this, just like there's not a one size fits all approach to a child and to a family um, when we're thinking about interventions. And the way that we want to measure that is having things that we are looking at and tracking over time and just making sure it's going in the right direction and iterating if it's not. 
Okay. Um, so we are almost out of time. There's an interesting, last, maybe almost last question here, which is from someone says she's having a hard time finding literature from the African-American perspective when it comes to ADHD and asks whether you have any recommendations. Yes, I actually do. And I want to make sure um, I give you the right name. Um there's a book called How Amari Learned to Love School Again. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about ADHD. And it's uh, created by a group a, of Black uh, psychiatrists, actually. Um, and it's a really well done book that talks about some of these things that have come up today. But it's a illustrated, you know, children's pictures book that's actually really beautifully illustrated as well. Um, and that's a place that I think uh, sounds like a great resource. Can you yeah. say the name again? Would you mind saying the name again? How, how, Amari, how Amari learned to love Amari. school again. How Amari learned to love school again. We will definitely be reviewing that on Attitude, put it in Attitude magazine. Dr. Vincent, this was really, really terrific. Thank you so much. This is a perspective that we just don't hear very often and we really want to hear more of. So I really thank you for your time and all of you who listened in, your great questions. And um, so uh, thanks. And uh, we're going to end the webinar now. Um, don't forget to stay tuned for our next webinars, those of you who are interested. Um, on Thursday, why, how behavior impedes learning. Um, next Tuesday, emotions and ADHD brains, why, how, why ADHD brains wrestle with emotional regulation. They should both be very interesting. And thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Vincent. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.